Hello, my name is Geraldine Seydoux. I am a professor at Johns Hopkins University and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And this is the second part of my presentation on how embryos elaborate body axes and how the single cell zygote becomes polarized. So in this second part, I'm gonna focus on how the cytoplasm of the zygote becomes polarized. So in the first part, I described how the sperm in Cenariobditis elegans polarizes the PAR proteins at the membrane of the one-cell embryo. Um, turns out that the PAR domains are controlling all of the different aspects of the polarity of the one-cell embryo. And that means that these proteins at the membrane direct what's going on in the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, there are several proteins and organelles that become asymmetrically distributed along the anterior-posterior axis. And this happens because you want different molecules to end up in the anterior and posterior cell um, that is formed at the first division. So in this presentation, we're going to focus on how do you generate these cytoplasmic asymmetries, and in particular, we're going to talk about how this protein here, MEX5, forms an anterior-posterior gradient in the cytoplasm. So here's a little movie showing you again how the PAR proteins um, become asymmetrically segregated, and down below, how this MEX5 protein becomes enriched on the anterior side. Okay, so MEX5 is an RNA binding protein. It's um, present uh, throughout the cytoplasm, and as you can see, uh, uh, as the PAR proteins become asymmetrically segregated, MEX5 responds and becomes um, enriched on the anterior side. Okay, so how does that work? Um, this was uh, the project of a postdoc in my lab, Eric Griffin. And Eric uh, was interested in figuring out how do you make this uh, MEX5 gradient. And at first he considered three possibilities. So one idea, given that we can see that MEX5 starts out uniformly distributed and then becomes asymmetric, one possibility is that you just make more MEX5 uh, in the anterior side. So you could translate more MEX5 protein specifically in the anterior cytoplasm and that would give you a gradient. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that in fact you're doing the opposite. You're actually degrading uh, MEX5 in the posterior cytoplasm. Okay, um, another possibility is that you're doing neither one of those things, but instead you're just taking the protein that was in the posterior and moving it towards the anterior side. Okay, so you're redistributing, uh, redistributing existing protein. So to distinguish between these different models, um, uh, Eric realized that these different models actually make different predictions uh, as to what happens to overall MEX5 levels. So in the first uh, case scenario, MEX5 levels would increase. Um, whereas if MEX5 is being degraded, then the overall level should decrease. But if you're just moving protein around, the MEX5 levels should stay constant. So uh, Eric had a feeling that he should really try to be able to study carefully what happens to MEX5 levels during this uh, polarization. He also realized that it would be very useful to be able to distinguish between the protein that's already present at the beginning uh, before polarization and the protein that might be made during the polarization process. So to accomplish both of these goals, um, uh, Eric created this uh, a fusion uh, version of MEX5 where MEX5 is fused to a fluorescent protein called Dendra that has very interesting um, capabilities. This is a protein that when it first folds uh, forms a fluorescent protein that fluoresces green. Okay, but if you expose this protein to UV light, now it fluoresces in a different color, in red. 
okay? And so this is a way to basically label protein at the time that you expose the embryo to UV light. Whatever protein is there is now going to become red, okay? Any new protein that's made later will still be green. So if you follow the embryos just looking at the red fluorescence, you can look at protein that was existing at the time that you started the experiment, okay? So this is called a photoactivatable uh, fluorescent protein, and it's very useful to follow uh, proteins uh, over time. So when he did this experiment, just exposing the whole embryo to fluorescent uh, to, to UV light, he saw that this red MEX5 protein was able to redistribute into a gradient uh, during the polarization process of the, um, uh, of the zygote. And so from this, he concluded that you don't need any new synthesis. Whatever protein's already there, it knows where to go. So that was interesting. Next, he uh, measured very carefully the amount of protein that existed at the beginning, before polarization, and at the end, after polarization. And what he found is that basically nothing changes. The total amount of protein doesn't change. What changes is that the amount in the anterior goes up and the amount in the posterior goes down. And that is consistent with some kind of redistribution, okay? And then another experiment that he did that, that confirmed that, in fact, the protein was moving around somehow is this one, where he labeled, instead of labeling all of the protein, as was done in this first experiment over here, he labeled only the protein that was on the posterior side at the beginning of the experiment. And then he watched what happens to this protein over time, and he found that Yes, it did accumulate on the interior side. So somehow protein is moving around in the embryo and knowing to go to the anterior side. So how could this happen? So um, this really suggested that this middle uh, uh, option is the right one. How is this happening? So then Eric decided to do another experiment where instead of um, illuminating large parts of the embryo uh, with the UV, he uh, decided to eliminate um, the embryo in just two areas, one stripe over here and another stripe over here. Okay, so these two areas were eliminated at the same time, and then you can see what happens to the protein in these two stripes over time. So over just six seconds, that's what I'm showing you here. And so it's a little bit hard to, to really understand what's happening when you just look at the embryos like this. So what he did is he created a chymograph from these um, uh, pictures. And a chymograph is basically just taking one slice, one uh, line across the embryo, and as shown here, and then showing how that line changes over time here, okay? So you could see what happens to the fluorescent protein that's very high in the middle of that line at the beginning of the experiment, and what happens to it over time. So each of these little lit up dots represent um, protein that's now diffusing away from the original spot where that protein was when it was first activated, photoactivated to fluoresce in the, in the red channel. So what you might notice is that proteins is diffusing, and it's diffusing in both directions, in both towards the anterior, which would be over here, and towards the posterior. So there doesn't appear to have any directed movement. The protein molecules are just diffusing randomly, okay? So that was a little puzzling because we know that overall there's more protein ending up in the anterior. So how can that be if the protein is just moving around randomly? Another thing that you might notice is that these two areas look different from one another. This one stays brighter in this area, in the middle, whereas this one is getting diffused faster, okay? And that is not because the laser was different in those two areas. The laser photoactivated the same amount of protein in those two areas. But what happened is that by the very first frame, you can see that the protein in this area is diffusing faster out of the 
original photoactivated area, whereas the protein in this area is staying around in this area longer. So that tells us that the rate of diffusion of the protein is different in these different parts of the cytoplasm. So Eric then decided to redo this experiment uh, by sampling many, many different points along the anterior-posterior axis. So in this graph, um, the whole length of the embryo is shown down here, okay, uh, from uh, the anterior over here all the way to the posterior. And at each of these points, Eric measured how fast the protein diffuses, okay? And you can see in the blue uh, line here, before polarization, the protein is diffusing very slowly, less than one micron squared per second. Okay, so it seems to be maybe bound to something, it's not moving very fast. But during the polarization process, something very interesting happened. The protein speeds up, but it speeds up only in the posterior cytoplasm. So just to summarize what I've shown you here, we start out at the beginning of the process, before polarization, with a MEX5 protein that's very sluggish in the cytoplasm. And then, during the polarization process, MEX5 becomes fast, but only on one side of the cytoplasm, okay? And this happens at the same time that we see this concentration of protein in the anterior, okay? So, we knew of another little tidbit, and that is that we knew that PAR1 is very important to create this MEX5 gradient. And this was work from Jim Priest's lab, who showed that PAR1, remember, this is one of the kinases that um, are part of the PAR group of polarity regulators, and PAR1 is enriched in the posterior side of the embryo. And what Jim Priest's lab had shown is that PAR1 phosphorylates MEX5, and this is important for MEX5 to become asymmetric. So we wondered, what exactly is PAR1 doing to MEX5 diffusion in the embryo? So here's an experiment where Eric measured the diffusion rate of MEX5 in both the anterior and the posterior cytoplasm. Um, so in wild type, you get two different values because it's slower in the anterior and faster in the posterior. And then what happens if you get rid of PAR1? You can get rid of PAR1 by getting rid of it using an RNAi uh, treatment or by using a nice PAR1 allele that was generated and characterized by ken ken fuse. In both of these cases, we now see that PAR1 stays, I mean, sorry, that MEX5 stays very sluggish. So if PAR1 is not around to phosphorylate MEX5, MEX5 stays slow in both the anterior and posterior cytoplasm. Okay, so that suggests that PAR1 is somehow required to speed up MEX5. And Eric got a very nice confirmation of this result using a different uh, PAR1 allele, this B274 allele. This is a PAR1 allele that actually um, is a premature stop codon in the PAR1 gene, and it creates a truncated PAR1 protein that now is not able to attach to the membrane, and this PAR1 protein is uniformly distributed throughout. So now you have the kinase everywhere. And when you do that, amazingly what you see is that MEX5 becomes fast everywhere, both in the anterior and in the posterior uh, cytoplasm. So this kind of experiment said that PAR1 is both necessary and sufficient to speed up the diffusion of MEX5 in the cytoplasm. All right, next experiment is we wondered whether this phosphorylation of MEX5 by PAR1 is, might be reversible. Could it be that MEX5 is actually cycling between being phosphorylated and unphosphorylated? And so to test this idea, uh, we uh, took MEX5 and PAR1 kinase in a test tube, put them to two together, and looked at MEX5 phosphorylation uh, using autoradiography um, as shown here. So the dark signal here uh, shows you that MEX5 has been phosphorylated by PAR1. So after Eric did that experiment, he added to the MEX5 PAR1 mixture, embryonic extract, just cytoplasmic extract from C. elegans embryos. And then he saw a really remarkable 
uh, effect of the embryonic extract, so that over time this embryonic extract was able to take away the phosphorylation um, from MEX5. And so it seems that this phosphorylation that um, PAR1 does to MEX5 is actually reversible. It's short-lived. It doesn't last for very long. And in fact, Eric was able to discover the phosphatase that is responsible for removing this phosphate. And it's present throughout the cytoplasm in the zygote. Okay, so PAR1 phosphorylates MEX5, but MEX5 has a way to quickly get rid of this phosphorylation. So keep that in mind. Next interesting observation that Eric made is he looked at the size of the complexes that MEX5 exist in, in the cytoplasm. He did this simply by running um, a whole worm extract uh, with MEX5 uh, labeled here with dendra, so we can see where it runs in the extract. And he passed this extract over a sucrose gradient so as to separate uh, light uh, complexes from heavy complexes, okay? And uh, what he saw is that MEX5 actually exists in both light complexes and heavy complexes. So that suggested to us that maybe that's how MEX5 is slow. Maybe it's slow when it's big and it's fast uh, when it's in a smaller complexes. So putting these uh, uh, observations together led us to this hypothesis for how a MEX5 gradient might form under the influence of this PAR1 kinase. We imagine that at the beginning of the, uh, of the polarization process, uh, MEX5 exists in these sluggish, large complexes that cannot move very fast into the cytoplasm. They might actually be tethered to something in the cytoplasm, and so that keeps them in place. When PAR1 becomes asymmetric uh, and it is enriched on one side of the embryo, it uh, can phosphorylate MEX5 preferentially on that side. And we imagine that when MEX5 becomes phosphorylated, it now uh, breaks away from these large complexes and exists in smaller complexes which are faster diffusing. Now, these smaller complexes can diffuse everywhere in all directions. So they do so all throughout the cytoplasm. But if, uh, remember, that the phosphorylation by PAR1 is short-lived. There is a phosphatase present throughout the cytoplasm that can remove this phosphorylation from MEX5. And when that happens, MEX5 is going to return into these larger complexes. And if this dephosphorylation event happens in this part of the cytoplasm where there's no PAR1, then the larger complexes will stay there longer. And so just following this kind of uh, thinking, you can imagine how by creating this diffusion gradient, you end up with a concentration gradient where you have more MEX5 in these slower complexes in the anterior side of the cytoplasm. So this was just a hypothetical model um, that we came up based on the amount of data that we had. But uh, a model is really only useful in if it actually predicts something that you can then experimentally test. And this model really uh, uh, predicted that MEX5 should exist into two species. So I already showed you that it looked like on a sucrose gradient, MEX5 did exist in both light and heavy species, but we wanted to be able to see those directly in the embryo. Could we detect a fast MEX5 and a slow MEX5? Okay, and so for this, Eric turned to a, a different technology uh, called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which is a, a microscopy technology that allows you to monitor the um, diffusion rate of individual molecules in small volumes of cytoplasm that you can sample with your microscope. Okay, and so by following the fluctuation in fluorescence in this small volume, you can, using uh, mathematics, deduce what kind of molecules are uh, traversing this small volume and how many different species are there and how fast are they diffusing.
So doing these kinds of experiments, Eric found that in the anterior cytoplasm, there in fact exists two different types of MEX5 molecules. A very sluggish MEX5 molecule um, that is really not diffusing very much at all, and then a faster one, okay? So that's the two molecules that exist in the anterior cytoplasm. And uh, in fact, remember that we had measured the average diffusion behavior of MEX5 using the DENDRA experiment that I uh, presented at the beginning of this presentation. And that average number actually uh, fits with uh, an average that we can get from uh, computing the average of these two um, numbers and also uh, taking into account how many of these two types of molecules there are. It turns out that there's a lot more of these very slow molecules in the anterior cytoplasm. And that's why that makes the overall population average quite slow in the anterior cytoplasm. What about in the posterior cytoplasm? Well, there, Eric found that those two species exist as well. There's also a very slow one and a very fast one, just like in the anterior cytoplasm. The difference, however, is in the proportion of those two species. In the posterior cytoplasm, the fast species is more abundant compared to what it was in the anterior. There's actually equal amount of the fast and the slow in the posterior, okay? So now this experiment is really uh, confirming our model that MEX5 exists in two species slow and fast. And what differs between the anterior and the posterior cytoplasm is the proportion of those two species. So now we are getting close to a molecular model for how this gradient forms. We know that we have two MEX5 species, a slow and a fast one, and that these two, the interconversion between these two species depends on this PAR1 kinase, which creates the fast species. But the fast species can revert back to the slow species through the action of this phosphatase that is present throughout the cytoplasm. So based on this information, we thought that maybe we would be very close to actually being able to model using mathematical uh, formulas the MEX5 gradient. Okay, so if this explains everything about how the gradient forms, just by inputting these values into a mathematical model, we should be able to recreate the MEX5 gradient. So for this, we had to team up with David O.D., a computational biologist who took our experimentally determined values together with the size of the C. elegans embryo and putting PAR1 uh, kinase in the posterior. And with all of this information, David was able to recreate uh, in a computer the MEX5 gradient. So here, um, the black line represents the total MEX5, which forms a gradient across the anterior posterior axis. And then the uh, red and the green lines represent the fast and the, and the slow um, MEX5. And you can see that in the, in the posterior cytoplasm, there's equal level of those two species, wh whereas in the anterior cytoplasm, there's more of the slow species. So this type of analysis is very satisfying because it suggests that maybe we can explain this MEX5 concentration gradient just by um, uh, imagining that the PAR1 kinase can change the diffusion rate of MEX5, okay? So here we have a gradient that's formed in the cytoplasm without having any directed movement. All we have is a local reversible phosphorylation that induces a local change in diffusion rate, and that is sufficient to create a gradient. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the MEX5 gradient and getting more of a direct feel for how such a gradient might form, you might be interested in this video from uh, David O.D. who collaborated with a dance company to bring the MEX5 gradient alive. So thank you again for um, following this uh, presentation.
and I hope to see you another time.